this lecture is about the inverted index construction. In this lecture, we will continue the discussion of system implementation. In particular, we're going to discuss how to construct the inverted index. The construction of the inverted index is actually very easy if the data set is very small. It's very easy to construct a dictionary and then store the postings in a file. The problem is that when our data is not able to fit to the memory, then we have to use some special method to deal with it. And unfortunately, in most retrieval applications, the data set would be large and they generally cannot be loaded into the memory at once. And there are many approaches to solve that problem. And sorting based method uh, is quite common and works in uh, four steps as shown here. First, you collect the local term ID, document ID, and frequency tuples. Basically, you're going to count the terms in uh, a small set of documents. Right? And then once you collect those counts, you can sort those um, counts based on terms so that you build a local, uh, a partial inverted index. And these are called uh, rounds. And then you write uh, them into a temporary file on the disk. And then you merge in step three, you would do pairwise merging of these rounds until you eventually merge all the rounds to generate a, a single inverted index. So this is the illustration of this method. On the left, you see some documents. And on the right, we have uh, shown a term lexicon and a document ID lexicon. And these lexicons are to map uh, string-based representations of document IDs or terms into integer representations or and, um, map back from uh, integers to the string representation. And the reason why we are interested in using integers to represent these IDs uh, is because uh, integers are, are often easier to handle. For example, integers can be used as index for array and they are also easy to compress. Um, and so this is uh, one reason why we uh, tend to map these strings into integers um, so, that we, so that we don't have to uh, carry these strings around. So how does this approach work? Well, it's very simple. We're going to scan these documents sequentially and then parse the documents and count the frequencies of terms. And in this um, stage, we generally sort the frequencies by document IDs because we process each document uh, sequentially. So we first encounter all the terms in uh, the first document. Therefore, the document IDs uh, are all ones in this case. Right? So, and uh, this will be followed by document IDs uh, two, tools. And they are naturally sorted in this order just because we process the data in the sequential order. At some point, uh, we will run out of memory and then we would have to, uh, to write them into the disk. But before we do that, we're going to uh, sort them. Uh, just to use whatever memory we have, we can sort them. And, and then this time, we're going to sort based on term IDs. Note that here, we're using uh, this the term IDs as a key to sort. So all the entries that share the same term would be grouped together. In this case, we can see all the, um, all the IDs uh, of documents that match term one would be grouped together. And we're going to write this into the disk as a temporary file. And that would uh, allow us to use the memory to process the next batch of documents. And we're going to do that for all the documents. So we're going to write a lot of temporary files into the disk. And then the next stage is to do merge sort. Basically, we're going to uh, merge them and then sort them. Eventually, we will get a single inverted index where the, uh, the entries are sorted based on term IDs. And on the top, we can see these are the order entries for the documents that match term ID 1. So this is basically how we can do um, the construction of inverted index, even though the data cannot be, um, be all loaded into the memory. Now, 
we mentioned earlier that uh, because the po postings are very large, it's desirable to compress them. So let's now talk a little bit about how we compress inverted index. Well, the idea of compression in, in general is to leverage skewed distributions of values. And we generally have to use variable lens encoding instead of the fixed lens encoding as we uh, use in uh, by default in a programming language like C++. And so how can we leverage the skewed distributions of values to uh, compress these values? Well, uh, in general, we would use fewer bits to encode those frequent words at the cost of using uh, longer bits to encode those in, uh, rare values. So in our case, let's think about how we can compress the TF, term frequency. Now, if you can picture what the inverted index would look like, and you will see in postings, there are a lot of uh, term frequencies. Those are the frequencies of terms uh, in all those documents. Now, we, if you think about what kind of values are most frequent there, you probably will be able to guess that the small numbers tend to occur far more frequently than large numbers. Why? Well, think about the distribution of words. And this is due to the Zipf's law. And many words occur just uh, rarely. So we see a lot of small numbers. Therefore, we can use a fewer bits for the small um, but highly frequent uh, integers. Uh, and at the cost of using more bits for large integers. Uh, this is a trade-off, of course. If the values are distributed uniform, then this won't save us any uh, space. But because we tend to see many small values, they are very frequent, uh, we can save on average. Uh, even though sometimes when we see a large number, we have to use a lot of bits. What about the document IDs that we also saw in postings? Well, they are not uh, distributed in a skewed way, right? So. Um, how can we deal with that? Well, it turns out that you can use a trick called a D-gap, and that, that is to store the difference of these term IDs. And we can uh, imagine if a term has matched many documents, then there will be a long list of document IDs. So when we take the gap and when we take the difference between adjacent document IDs, those gaps will be small. So we will again see a lot of small numbers Whereas if a term occurred in only a few documents, then the gap would be large. The large numbers will not be frequent. So this creates some skewed distribution that would allow us to, uh, to compress these values. And this is also possible because in order to uncover or uncompress these document IDs, we have to sequentially process the data because we store the difference. And in order to recover the the exact document ID, we have to first recover the previous document ID, and then we can add the difference to the previous document ID uh, to restore the, the current document ID. Now, this was possible because we only need to have sequential access to those document IDs. Once we look up a term, we fetch all the document IDs that match the term, then we sequentially process them. So it's very natural. That's why this uh, trick actually works. And there are many different methods for encoding. So binary code uh, is a commonly used code in, in just uh, in any program language where we use basically a fixed length encoding. Uh, unary code, and gamma code, and delta code are all possibilities, and there are many other possibilities. So let's look at some of them in more detail. Um, binary coding is really equal length encoding, and that's appropriate for uh, randomly distributed values. The unary coding is uh, is a variable length encoding method. In this case, uh, an integer that's uh, at least one would be encoded uh, as x minus one one bits followed by zero. So, for example, three would be encoded as uh, two ones followed by zero, whereas five would be encoded as four ones followed by zero, etc. So now now you can imagine um, how many bits. Do we have to use for a large number like 100? So how many bits do we have to use exactly for a number like 100? Well, exactly uh, we have to use 100 bits, right? So it's the same number of bits as the value of this number. 
So this is very inefficient. If you will likely see some large numbers, imagine if you occasionally see a number like 1,000, you have to use 1,000 bits. So this only works well if you are absolutely sure that uh, there will be no large numbers. Mostly, very uh, very often you see very small numbers. Now, how do you decode this code? Now, since these are variable length encoding methods, and you can't just count how many bits and then they just stop, right? And you can say eight bits or thirty-two bits, then you you will start uh, another code. They are variable lengths, so. Uh, you have to rely on some uh, mechanism. In this case, for unary, you can see it's very easy to see the boundary. Now, you can easily see zero would signal the end of encoding. So you just count how many ones you have seen, and then until you hit zero, you know you have finished one uh, number. You will start another number. Now, we just saw that the unary coding is too aggressive in um, rewarding you know, uh, small numbers. And if you occasionally can see a very big number, it will be a disaster. So what about some other uh, less aggressive um, method? Well, gamma coding is one of them. And in this method, we're going to use unary coding for uh, a transformed form of the value. Um, so it's one plus the floor of log of x. So the magnitude of this value is uh, much lower than the original uh, x. So that's why uh, we can afford using unary code for that. So, and so we'll uh, first have the unary code for uh, coding this log of x. And this will be followed by a uniform code or binary code. And this is basically the same. The uniform code and bin binary code are, are the same. And we're going to mm, use this code to code the remaining part of the value of x. And this is basically precise x minus 1 to, to the floor of log of x. So the unary code basically coded the floor of log of x. Well, add 1 there, like here. Uh, but um, the remaining part will be using uniform code to actually code the difference between the x and the, and this um, 2 to the log of uh, x. And, and it's easy to, uh, to show that uh, for this, uh, this value, this difference, we only need uh, to use up to uh, this many bits and the floor of log of x bits. And this is easy to understand. If the difference is too large, then we would have a higher uh, floor of log of x. So here are some examples. For example, 3 is encoded as 101. The first two digits are the unary code. Right? So this is for uh, the value 2. Right? 1, 0 encodes 2 in unary coding. And so that means log of x, the floor of log of x is 1, because we want to actually use unary code to encode 1 plus the floor of log of x. Since this is 2, then we know that the floor of log of x is actually 1. So, But uh, 3 is still larger than 2 to the 1. So the difference is 1, and that 1 is encoded uh, here at the end. So that's why we have 101 for 3. Now, uh, similarly, 5 is encoded as 110 followed by 01. And in this case, the unary code uh, encodes 3. And so this is the unary code, 110. And so the floor of log of x is 2. And that means uh, we're going to compute the difference between 5 and uh, 2 to the 2. And that's 1. And so we now have, again, 1 at the end. But this time, we're going to use 2 bits, because uh, with this uh, level of flow of log of x, uh, we could have more numbers, you know, 5, 6, 7. They would all uh, share the same prefix here, 110. So in order to differentiate them, we have to use 2 bits uh, in the end to differentiate them. So you can imagine 6 would be uh, 10 here in the end instead of 0, 1 after 110.
it's also true that uh, the form of a gamma code is always um, the first odd number of bits and in the center in the, there is a zero that's the end of the unary code and before that or, or to, uh, on the left side of this zero uh, there will be all ones and on the right side of this zero uh, it's binary coding or uni uniform coding so how can you decode uh, such a code well you again first do unary coding right once you hit zero you know you have got the unary code and this also will tell you how many bits you have to read further to decode the uniform code so this is how you can decode a gamma code uh, there is also delta code that's basically the same as a gamma code except that uh, you replace the unary prefix with a gamma code so that's even less conservative than gamma code in terms of rewarding the small integers so that means it's okay if you occasionally see a large number it's it's you know it's okay with delta uh, code it's also fine with gamma code it's you know it's really um, a big loss for unary code and they are all uh, operating, um, of course, at different degrees of favoring uh, short, uh, favoring small integers, and that also means uh, you, they would be appropriate for a certain distribution. But none of them is perfect for all distributions, and which method works uh, the best would have to depend on the actual distribution in your data set. For invert index uh, compression, people have found that gamma coding seems to work well. So how do we uncompress inverted index? Um, we just uh, talked about this. First, you decode those encode uh, integers. And we just, uh, I think, discussed uh, how we decode unary coding and gamma coding. So I won't repeat. Uh, what about the document IDs that might be compressed using dgap? Well, uh, we're going to do sequential decoding. So suppose the encoded ID list is x1, x2, x3, etc. We first decode x1 to op obtain the first document ID, ID1. Then we would decode x2, which is actually the difference between the second ID and the first one. So we have to add the decoder value of x2 to ID1 to recover the value of the, the ID at this second position. So this is where you can see the advantage of uh, converting document IDs into integers and that allows us to do this kind of compression. And we just repeat until we decode all the uh, documents. Every time we use the document ID in the previous position to help recover the document ID in the next position. Mm -hmm.